Good day. Welcome to Clinical Pharmacy and Pharmacotherapeutics 2, Gastrointestinal System Therapeutics. So before our discussion, here is my disclosure and disclaimer. The content presented in this YouTube channel or video contains pharmaceutical lectures that are solely for educational purposes and does not intend to provide medical advice. The information provided in this video is based on standard references, reputable sites, and updated guidelines. This lecture is not intended to replace professional medical advice or treatment. Viewers are advised to consult with their healthcare provider before making any medical decisions or changes to their treatment plan. The lecturer does not receive any compensation or financial benefit from the mention of any proprietary products or devices in this presentation. Any reference to such products or devices is purely for educational purposes and does not imply endorsement or promotion. By watching this video, Viewers acknowledge that they are responsible for their own health decisions and that the content presented is not a substitute for professional medical advice or treatment. The lecturer and YouTube channel do not assume any liability for any damages or consequences arising from the use of the information provided in this video. So for our discussion, we are going to focus specifically on irritable bowel disease or IBD. So let us first define what is IBD. Irrit irritable bowel disease or IBD is an idiopathic disease caused by a dysregulated immune response to host intestinal microflora. Inflammatory bowel disease encompasses two types of idiopathic intestinal disease that are differentiated by their location and depth of involvement in the bowel wall. Ulcerative colitis, or UC, involves diffuse inflammation of the colonic mucosa. Most often, UC affects the, re the rectum, also called proctitis, but it may extend into the sigmoid, called as proctosigmoiditis, beyond the sigmoid, called distal ulcerative colitis, or include the entire colon up to the cecum, called as pancolitis. On the other hand, Crohn disease, or CD, results in transmural ulceration of any portion of the gastrointestinal tract or the GI, most often affecting the terminal ileum and colon. Due to segmented parts affected, CD is characterized to having skip lesions. Both diseases are classified by extent, either mild, moderate, or severe, and location. CD is also classified by phenotype inflammatory stricturing or penetrating. Besides the GI tract, both Crohn disease and ulcerative colitis have many extra-intestinal manifestations. While in most patients, the disorders can be distinguished in at least 10% of patients, the features are so similar that it is not possible to initially differentiate between the two disorders. Both disorders have a gen genetic predisposition, neither is curable, and they both carry enormous morbidity. Finally, both increase the risk of colorectal cancer. Three characteristics define the etiology of inflammatory bowel disease or IBD. 
the following are number one, genetic predisposition, two, an altered dysregulated immune response, and lastly, an altered response to gut microorganisms. However, the triggering event for the activation of the immune response in IBD has yet to be identified. Possible factors related to this event include a pathogenic organism still yet to be identified or an inappropriate response such as failure to downgrade the inflammatory response to an antigen such as an alteration in the barrier function. No mechanism has been identified as the primary cause, but many are postulated about IBD. The lymphocyte population in persons with IBD is polyclonal, making the search for a single precipitating cause very difficult. In any case, an inappropriate activation of the immune system leads to continued inflammation of the intestinal tract with both an acute characterized as neutrophilic and chronic characterized as lymphocytic histrocytic inflammatory response. Several environmental risk factors have been proposed as contributing to the IBD pathogenesis, but the results are inconsistent and the limitation of the studies preclude drawing firm conclusion. The most consistent associate, association described has been smoking, which increases the risk of Crohn disease. However, current smoking protects against ulcerative colitis, whereas former smoking increases the risk of ulcerative colitis. Dietary factors have also been inconsistently described. In some studies, high fiber intake and high intake of fruits and vegetables appear protective against IBD. In terms of genetic predisposition, persons with IBD have a genetic susceptibility for the disease. Note that these genes appear to be permissive, meaning they allow IBD to occur, but they are not causative, meaning just because the gene is present does not necessarily mean the disease will develop. First degree relatives have 520 fold increased risk of developing IBD as compared with persons from unaffected families. The child of a parent with IBD has a 5% risk of developing the same. Twin studies show a concordance of approximately 70% in identical twins versus 5 to 10% in non identical twins. Of patients with IBD, 10 to 25% are estimated to have first degree relative with the disease, and therefore, monozygous twin studies show a high concordance for Crohn disease, but less so for ulcerative colitis. Specific genes studied to be associated with Crohn disease includes CARD15, which is from the chromosome 16 or known as IBD1 gene, led to the identification of three single nucleotide polymorphisms, two are missense and one a frame shift in the NOD2 gene. Basically, CARD15 is a polymorphic gene involved in the innate immune system. The gene has more than 60 variations of which three play in the role of 27% of patients with Crohn's disease, primarily in patients with ileal disease. For ulcerative colitis, the genetic predisposition appears to be lesser in magnitude than Crohn's disease. Now for the pathophysiology of IBD, what you can see in your slide is the model of pathological mechanisms for the TWIC FN14 pathway in IBD. TWIC stands for tumor necrosis factor related weak inducer of apoptosis. This is a member of the tumor necrosis factor superfamily that acts on cells by binding to its only receptor which is FN14. FN14 stands for fibroblast growth factor inducible 14. 
Now, if we are going to zoom out this particular diagram, we can see that the development of IBD commonly begins when damage to epithelial cells and barrier function are initiated. This will lead to excessive stimulation of the luminal bacteria, as you can see in here. So there's a stimulation from commensal flora, and this will subsequently lead to the production of inflammatory mediators. So there would be recruitment and activation of inflammatory cells in this case. This cycle, numbers 1, 2, and 3, becomes a rigorous cycle, eventually developing into fibrosis or basically dysregulated tissue repair. Eventually, this will lead, or in conclusion, this will lead to IBD. Now, based on the World Gastroenterology Organization, or WGO, there are signs and symptoms associated with IBD. So several uh, of these signs and symptoms are associated with inflammatory damage of the digestive tract, as exhibited by the following. First, we have diarrhea. This is uh, described as an inflammatory disease where in mucose or blood may be present in the stool and it can occur at night and incontinence may also occur. Basically, grossly bloody stools, occasionally with tenesmus, although typical of ulcerative colitis, but are less common in Crohn disease. Stools may be formed, but loose stools predominate if the colon or the terminal ileum is involved extensively. 50% of patients with Crohn disease may present with perianal disease, such as fistula or abscesses. For constipation, this may be the primary symptom in ulcerative colitis. When the disease is limited to the rectum, constipation may occur and may proceed to possible bowel obstruction. Next is bowel movement abnormalities. Pain and rectal bleeding may be, may be present as well as severe urgency and tenesmus. Abdominal cramping and pain is exhibited in particular quadrants. For the ulcerative colitis, it is in the periumbilically or in the left lower quadrant, most specifically if it's a moderate to severe ulcerative colitis. While for Crohn disease, it is normally exhibited at the right lower quadrant. Nausea and vomiting also occurs with Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, although it is more often in CD than ulcerative colitis. The manifestations of inflammatory bowel disease generally depend on the area of the intestinal tract involved. Now, for with physical examination of patients with IBD, the following can be observed. Patients can manifest tachycardia, anxiety, fever, dehydration, and other observations may include anemia, Pallor may also be noted for these patients. Toxic megacolon can also happen. Toxic megacolon, remember that toxic megacolon is a medical emergency. Patients would appear septic, meaning to say they will manifest with high fever, liturgy, chills, and tachycardia, and they may have increasing abdominal pain, tenderness, and distension. 
In Crohn's disease, one may note fistula, as I've mentioned a while ago, abscesses, or even rectal prolapse. Occult blood on digital rectal exam can also be common. And in children, growth retardation may be noted. Now, let's go to the summary of treatment for IBD. There are several treatment options for this condition. Among which would be our first are the amino salicylate. Amino salicylates, specifically 5 amino salicylic acid or 5 ASA. This is a class of drugs that are considered safe and effective for long term treatment options for IBD. These drugs are available both in oral and rectal preparations. For rectal preparations, they come in suppositories, enema, and foams. Now, a good example of 5 amino salicylates are mesalazine and sulfasalazine. The mechanism of action of 5 ASA is basically to reduce the inflammation by inhibiting the release of interleukin 1 thus preventing recruitment of leukocytes into the bowel wall. Common adverse effects include renal compli complications, drug-induced liver injury, injury rather, dyspepsia, rash, urticaria, and eosinophilia. So it should be remembered that when starting patients on therapy, it is important that baseline and ongoing renal and liver function tests, LFT, are taken since renal and liver disease may complicate the IBD itself. In mild to moderate ulcerative colitis, 5 ASA are the treatment of choice, and all patients should be offered a 5 ASA at a dose of 2, 2 to 3 grams per day orally. Patients experiencing flare-ups can be escalated to a dose of about 4 to 4.8 grams per day. Now, for ulcerative colitis, should be offered, patients should be offered a combination of oral and enema of 5 amino salicylate. This will depend on the location and disease type. For pharmacists, we can optimize medication regimens to help reduce waste. For example, recommending once daily 5 amino salicylate dosing instead of twice daily. It should also be noted that treatment with 5 amino salicylates is not recommended for induction or maintenance treatment of Crohn disease. Next treatment are the corticosteroids. So both patients with UC and CD the, who do not have or who are not able to achieve remission with 5-ASA can be escalated to a more potent anti-inflammatory agent, which are your corticosteroids. However, they should only be used acutely and not for maintenance therapy. Now, the aim of treatment for corticosteroids is to reduce, uh, rather to induce remission and to maximize local effects while limiting systemic effects. This has been more important during the COVID-19 pandemic because it is vital to limit the time spent in hospital by immunocompromised patients. Corticosteroids use includes prednisolone, beclometasone, and mudesonide. These are considered broad-spectrum anti-inflammatory agents they, that work by modulating several inflammatory pathways. For prednisolone, oral prednisolone is superior to 5-ASA for inducing remission of mild to moderate and moderate to severe UC. It is also effective as an oral step-down agent for patients that have responded to the initial treatment of intravenous steroids such as hydrocortisone 100 mg four times a day following hospitalization 
for acute severe ulcerative colitis or what we call ASUC. Patients should be assessed for clinical and biochemical response after three days of IV steroid therapy to determine the need for salvage pharmacological or surgical therapy. The optimal dose of both UC and CD is uncertain. However, the current dose recommendation for oral prednisolone is 40 mg a day, with an aim to taper over 6 to 8 weeks, usually tapered by 5 mg per week. We can also use second-generation corticosteroids such as what I have mentioned, beclometasone dipropionate, and slow-release budesonide. These drugs have high affinity for the intracellular glucocorticoid receptor in the GI tract. Thus, they exert local and selective potent anti-inflammatory effects at the site of inflammation. These drugs have a lower systemic availability owing to their extensive pre-systemic metabolism within the mucosa of the small intestine and the liver. Therefore, they are known as topically acting even though they are taken orally. Rectal steroid preparations can be used to treat proctitis, proctosigmoiditis, and colitis in CD. Rectal mesalazine should be used for UC owing to higher efficacy. It is important to choose preparations according to the part of the colon affected. Next class of drugs are the immunodulators. Now, these are drugs that alter the activity of the immune system. For IBD, immunodulators used would include thiopurines, methotrexate, cyclosporine, and biologic or targeted cell therapies. The use of these agents basically increases the risk of patients succumbing to opportunistic infection which can be easily prevented if we perform screening and vaccination. So remember that before we initiate any form of immunosuppressant or biologic therapy, it is good to practice to pre-screen patients with IBD with the following information. For example, did they, do they have vaccinations if necessary for treatment or history of tuberculosis, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, varicella zoster, HIV, Epstein-Barr virus, cytomegalovirus, baseline renal function, and baseline liver function. It should be noted that all patients with IBD receiving immunosuppressants should also receive influenza, pneumococcal, and COVID-19 vaccinations. Specifically, let's have thiopurines. Around 60% of patients with IBD receive oral thiopurines in the form of either azathioprine or 6-marcaptopurine or in rare cases, we have the thioguanine. So these immunosuppressive agents deactivate T-lymphocyte processes that lead to inflammation and are effective at maintaining steroid-free remission in CD and UC. However, they should not be used to induce remission. In patients with UC, thiopurines can be initiated if more than or equal to two exacerbations have occurred within a 12-month window. If remission is not maintained by 5 ASA or after a single episode of ASUC, for patients with CD, thiopurines can be added to glucocorticoids or budesonide to induce remission if the patient has had more than or equal to two exacerbations within a 12-month period or if tapering of glucocorticoids has failed. Monitoring or rather monotherapy can be continued to maintain remission of CD. So we have to remember that prior to starting therapy, Again, patients should undergo pre-screening for viral infections like what I have mentioned a while ago and enzyme activity that could affect the dosing. Nausea may be experienced by a minority of patients 
which can lead to intolerances to the treatment. So we should advise patients to take, the, to take their tablets after meals so as to relieve this particular symptom. Severe diarrhea recurring on the challenge has been reported in patients treated with acetyoprene. And pharmacy should be aware that such symptoms might be drug-related. Other serious adverse events would include myelosuppression and opportunistic infection, deranged liver function, and hypersensitivity reaction, including pancreatitis. For the long-term treatment, it is associated with the risk of lymphoproliferative disorders and non-melanoma skin cancer. The risk of relapse should be weighed against the risk of long-term thiopurine therapy. In particular, the risk of lymphoma rises markedly with increasing age. So at least two years should elapse between completion of cancer treatment and starting therapy for IBD with thiopurines or biologics, although this depends on the agent base being considered and availability of other options to control the IBD. Other immunosuppressants that can be used, as I've mentioned, can include methotrexate and cyclosporin. These are really indicated following wider availability of other biologics and targeted cell therapies. Now, the introduction of biosimilars are also improved the cost-effectiveness of some biologic therapies. Nevertheless, they are still useful as second-line agents to induce remission in CD when other agents such as biologics fail. The dose of methotrexate starts at 15 mg weekly with subcutaneous formulations having better bioavailability compared to oral, particularly at higher doses owing to malabsorption. Remember that folic acid 5 mg weekly should be given with methotrexate to reduce the risk of gastrointestinal and liver toxicity. On the other hand, cyclosporine for ASUC treatment has been suspected or rather superseded by infliximab. However, IV cyclosporin can be given as a salvage therapy for ASUC at a dose of 2 mg per kilogram per day with a target trough concentration of 150 to 250 nanogram per ml. Therapeutic drug monitoring is required to minimize the risk of toxic side effects, which includes serious infections, nephrotoxicity, anaphylaxis, and death. Administration should be via non-PVC infusion sets to mitigate any adsorption of the drug onto the equipment. So let's move now to the other biologic and targeted cell therapy. For biologic and targeted cell therapy, it occurs when conventional options have failed or contraindications are present, such as if the patient had hepatitis B infection, low levels of TPNT, or severe renal liver impairment. Initiation and management of therapy is overseen by secondary care clinician. For this particular set of treatment, prior to initiation, it is important to consider the following, the mode of action, the practicality of administration for the patient, speed of onset, especially, especially if the goal is to induce remission, comorbidities, comorbidities rather, such as cancer and heart failure, and extra-intestinal manifestations, such as if the patient has uveitis, pyoderma gangrenosum, and also the supportive therapy. So the Regional Medicines Optimization Committee or the RMOC guidance suggests that decisions regarding biologic treatments, whether in treatment, naive patients, or in those using sequential therapies should be based on shared decision-making to ensure treatment in appropriate, safe, and clinically cost-effective. It is therefore paramount that patients are offered the best choice of treatment first time in line with get it right first time principle.
So under this, we have also the anti-tumor necrosis factor, monoclonal antibodies. Example under this is the infliximab. Infliximab. Sorry for the writing. Infliximab and adalimumab. Ah. ADA, sorry, that's ADA, LI, MU, MAB. So, adalimumab. These are licensed for both UC and CD with comparable efficacy, while golimumab is currently licensed for ulcerative colitis alone. So, the third is goli. Mumab. So this monoclonal antibody, antibodies bind and inactivate circulating tumor necrosis factor or TNF alpha, disrupting the inflammatory cascade with a, with a more targeted approach than corticosteroids and thiopurines. So, infliximab is a chimeric monoclonal antibody with both murine and human amino acid sequences and is available as an IV and sub-Q formulation. For IV infusions, they are administered at 5 mg per kilogram at weeks 0, 2, and 6, reducing to every 8 weeks thereafter. And patients can be converted to 120 mg sub-Q every fortnight following IV loading at weeks 0 and 2. Thiopurines can be added to avoid loss of response to infliximab, providing an additive effect and thiopurine suppression of immunogenicity. Monitoring of infliximab trough levels, about 3 to 7 mg per ml, will determine whether dosing can be increased to 5 mg per kilogram every 4 weeks or 10 mg every 8 weeks. It is important that response is reviewed following the third dose post-titration. For adalimumab, it is a fully humanized monoclonal antibody available as a subcutaneous formulation. The dosing or the licensed dosing is at 80 mg at week 0, then 40 mg every fortnight thereafter. Clinicians can opt for an accelerated initiation with 100, 160 mg at week 0, then 80 at week 2, reducing to 40 mg every fortnight thereafter. Patients showing signs of losing response to therapy, such as flare-ups, should have adalimumab levels measured. The target is around more than 8.5 micrograms per ml, for consideration of dose escalation to 40 mg weekly or 80 mg every fortnight. The combination of anti-TNF-alpha and thiopurine therapy increases the risk of serious opportunistic infections and hepatosplenic T-cell lymphoma. This should be way, uh, rather way against the potential benefits. Concomitant corticosteroids as a third immunosuppressive therapy when used to induce remission may further increase the relative risk of serious and opportunistic infections. Prophylaxis again pneumocystis gerovisi, which is previously pneumocystis saccharini, with oral cotrimoxazole 960 mg three times a week or 480 mg daily should be considered. There is an association between the patients who carry the HLA-DQA1 asterisk O5 gene and development of antibodies against anti-TNF agents. Pre-treatment testing can determine which patients might benefit from combination of anti-TNF-alpha and immunodulators. The next are the anti-integrin therapy. So this therapy, integrin, are transmembrane receptors that facilitate cell addition, inhibiting the actions of integrin on the surface of immune cells and endothelial cell adhesion molecules will inhibit interaction between leukocytes and intestinal vasculature, which blocks the inflammatory process. 
Example of this is the Vedu Lisumab. Lusuma. Sorry. So, Vedu Lisumab. This is a humanized monoclonal antibody that uh, acts to inhibit lymphocyte adhesion, particularly the mucosal addressing cell adhesion molecule, dash 1, or the MADCAM dash 1, which is selected for alpha 4 beta 7 integrin. So this is more specific to GI tract than other leukocyte adhesion inhibitors such as the natalizumab. And this is more uh, safe and effective in IBD. So this drug is both used or licensed for use for use in CD for induction and maintenance therapy and is available as IV and sub -Q formulation. The IV dosing is around 300 mg at week 0, 2, and 6 with 8 weekly infusions thereafter. And if the patient opts for the sub formulation as maintenance therapy, it may be initiated following uh, at least two IV infusions of at week 0 and 2. The intravenous dose can be increased to 300 mg every four weeks to target therapeutic levels of more than 7.4 micrograms per ml if patients are showing loss of response. So vedulizumab is currently the approved or currently approved by the National Institute of Health and Care Excellence or the NICE for moderate to severe active CD and if anti-TNF treatment has failed or if anti-TNF agents cannot be tolerated or are contraindicated. For moderate to severe active UC, vedolizumab can be used as a first line option. Now, this drug has a theoretical risk of progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. So that's why pharmacists should monitor and counsel the patients on the following. If there are new or worsening neurological signs and symptoms such as progressive weakness on one side of the body or clumsiness of the limbs, if there are vision disturbances, if there's a change in the thinking, memory, and orientation leading to confusion and personality changes, uh, patients displaying any signs and symptoms suggestive of PML and should be immediately referred to a neurology team in vedolizumab should be withheld. Next is the interleukin inhibitors. Example of this one is the us te kinumab. Kinumab. So this is an antagonist of the P40 subunit of pro-inflammatory cytokines interleukin-12 and interleukin-23. Recently licensed for the induction and maintenance therapy of CD and UC. The initiation dose is given IV at around 6 mg per kilogram and then thereafter it is switched to a subcutaneous formulation at the dose of 90 mg, 12 weekly or 8 weekly. The NICE commonly or rather currently recommends the use of ostekinumab for moderate to severe active CD for adults who have not responded to anti-TNF or conventional therapy or contraindications to such therapy. Now, in moderate to severe active UC, the drug is recommended in adults who have not responded or have contraindications to anti-TNF therapy. In terms of side effects, common are sore throat or cold, dizziness and headaches, diarrhea, nausea or vomiting, itching, back pain, muscle pain or joint pain, fatigue. Patients should also be aware of the less common side effects such as depression, tooth infection, injection site reaction, Bell's palsy, and vaginal infection in women. So last, on the list of our treatment are the Janus kinase inhibitors. 
Janus kinase are small molecules that acts to inhibit or serve as inhibitors to disrupt phosphorylation of JAK enzymes on cytokine receptors, inhibiting the inflammatory pathway in IBD. Currently, tolfacitinib, rather tofacitinib, sorry for that, tofa, T-O-F-A, C-I-T-I-N-I-B, is the only licensed JAK inhibitor for ulcerative colitis. So this is formulated as an oral uh, formulation, uh, particularly as a tablet, and as a small molecule. It does not have an issue on immunogenicity with other immunogenitors. The dose is at 10 mg twice a day for 8 weeks, followed by 5 mg twice a day for maintenance. So relatively, since this is a new drug, a black triangle warning uh, denoting that patients require extra monitoring while taking are recommended. So pharmacists must be aware of the contraindications, special warnings and precautions and ensure patients. Especially, do not have risk factors for uh, venous thromboembolism, thromboembolism. Those with lymphocyte count of more than 750 cells per millimeter uh, cubic millimeter have a neutrophil count of more than 2,000 cells per millimeter, cubic millimeter, contraindicated if less than one cells per millimeter, have a baseline lipid measurement, are not at risk of serious infection, and have a full vaccination screening history. Venous thromboembolism risk is also noted for tolfacitinib, such as we need to Check on the history regarding previous BTE, patients undergoing major surgery, if there is immobilization, myocardial infarction, heart failure, use of combined hormonal contraceptives or hormonal replacement, inherited coagulation disorder, and malignancy. Thank you.